Hi, Dr. Chol Kim here from sunny San Diego, California. I'm at the North American Spine Society with my esteemed colleagues. And I have Dr. Mark Michael, and he is part of the Illinois Bone and Joint Group, and that is a huge orthopedic surgery practice here in uh, Chicago. And we're gonna talk about something called cervical spinal stenosis. So for those patients that have neck pain, they go see their primary care doctor, they get an MRI, and they get the report back, and it says cervical stenosis. We're talking about the neck. Yes. Should I be worried as a patient? What should I be looking for? And when should I go see a spine surgeon? That's a great question. And oftentimes patients will come in with their report and in fact read it to me. What does this mean? What does this mean? The answer to your question is it depends. <laughs> it depends on multiple, a lot of factors. Um, Primarily, what is the patient complaining about? I mean, do they have any complaints at all? Um, is it complaints of pain going down the arm, nerve type pain going down the arm? Are they having things like uh, problems with uh, handling small objects, balance, those kinds of stuff? And in regard to the stenosis, um, there are several types of stenosis that are usually read out on a report, and those are in different parts of the spine and each part of the spine where the, you find the stenosis has different implications. So for example, a lot of times patients will have stenosis in the report, which is what we refer to as foraminal. And foraminal means it's stenosis on the side of the spine where the nerves come out of the spine, usually producing some kind of nerve pain. Those situations aren't particularly dangerous and shouldn't be something that the patient should come in very worried about. Because they don't, it's not compressing the spinal cord it's compressing the little nerve roots that come off the spinal cord. Correct, and in fact, a lot of those conditions where you have stenosis in the frame and compressing the nerve, like you just described, are uh, very well treated conservatively, meaning not necessarily with a surgery. The other type of stenosis that you can find in the cervical spine is in the center of the canal where the spinal cord runs. And that could be a little bit of a more dangerous situation because when you have pressure on the spinal cord, it doesn't take a lot of pressure for the cord to start to have issues. Um, and in those situations, those patients typically present with very vague symptoms. So they don't often start with a spine surgeon uh, because the symptoms start with either numbness and tingling in their hands or feet or problems with their balance or something that just doesn't seem like it's related to your spine or your neck at all. And those are the patients where they should come see the surgeon and we should really have a serious talk about what these implications are. Now you brought up something that's really important um, that we as spine surgeons know, but maybe a lot of people don't know. You can have an abnormal MRI and have no symptoms. That's what's so strange. So I think it's important to point out that you can have a diagnosis of spinal stenosis, but you may not have any symptoms because it's not bad enough in your particular case. How often does that occur? Um, and what do you do with those patients that have that diagnosis? Do you need to keep watching them? Do they need to take precautions? Um, or they, do they just need to be really healthy and fit? That's a great question, and it's very common. Um, you have to treat the patient, not the MRI. And if someone comes in with all these findings of stenosis here and there and degeneration, and they have no complaints, no pain, no weakness, no nerve signs, other than maybe some neck pain. Other than some neck pain. Most of them don't need a lot of treatment or surveillance. A lot of times we treat that conservatively to treat the neck pain with either therapy or anti-inflammatories or other conservative modalities. Um, the only time that you really want to monitor someone closely over a longer period of time is in the setting where they have that central stenosis or the pressure on the spinal cord, but they're not really displaying any signs of that condition. Uh, those are patients you may want to kind of keep an eye on either annually or, you know, whatever time interval you choose just to make sure it doesn't progress. I always have one or two patients like that <laughs> that yeah. I'm constantly watching. Um, when do you think surgery is reasonable? Like what type of patient you think benefits from surgery? Well, the first thing and the most important thing is that their symptoms match what you're seeing on the MRI. Um, if they have nerve pain that goes down a certain nerve distribution, we label them, you know, one through whatever, um, and they have failed non-operative treatments. So that could be therapy or oral medications or injections or, or whatever you try. 
Um, those patients, they do very well with surgical intervention because they have uh, the findings that display compression of what they're complaining about, and if you fix that, they usually do very well. The other patient that would benefit from surgery are the ones that have that central stenosis or that pressure on the cord that are displaying some neurologic signs of that condition. And for those patients, you usually do offer surgery in order to stop progression of that disease. What kind of symptoms should patients be looking out for when they have a compressed spinal cord? So the earliest signs are very, very vague. Uh, meaning, if you just notice just a little bit of clumsiness, your handwriting is changing, you're having difficulty buttoning your shirt, you're stumbling when you walk, um, that could be early signs of it. It can progress to um, a little bit of uh, numbness, tingling, weakness, those kind of things are early, early signs. Uh, as it progresses, you do get clearly arm pain, you get weakness in the arms and legs, and, and it cascades from there. But hopefully we try to catch those conditions sooner than that. Yeah, that can be a tricky one because if there's not a lot of pain, many patients just kind of accommodate to things. When it comes to pain, it's, it's not something that people can accommodate to, and um, that makes spinal stenosis challenging. Now, if you have to do a surgery on a patient, um, you know, we can go in from the front, we can go in from the back, we can do one level, we can do more than one level, we can do a disc replacement, we can do a fusion, we could just do a decompression, laminectomy. How do you go about deciding what surgery to do on a patient with cervical spinal stenosis? So we could talk about surgical procedures all day. Um, but the bottom line is you have to tailor it to the individual patient and the individual problem they have. Um, and all of those procedures that you listed um, ha can have excellent outcomes for the right reason. So you have a patient, you look at their problem, you look at what they're complaining about, and you try to tailor the procedure just to uh, best address that problem. Now the biggest kind of new thing coming out, which is not new, is to do a disc replacement instead of a fusion. And when the disc replacement device first came out, the FDA during the study said you shouldn't do patients with spinal stenosis, just patients with radiculopathy or discogenic arthritic pain. But things seem to be changing. What's your take on that? A patient that has cervical stenosis causing mild myelopathy. That's when the spinal cord is compressed and it's not happy and you're getting these subtle spinal cord symptoms like clumsiness, numbness, and tingling, and weakness. What do you think about doing a disc replacement or a motion preservation procedure in a setting like that? That's the beauty of medicine and spine surgery is that uh, as time goes on, we have more evidence to show that what we're doing is the right thing for our patient. And as time goes on, we get more and more information. So, you know, there's a lot of studies now showing that whether you do a fusion or a motion preservation disc replacement on myelopathic patients, their clinical outcomes can be identical. The same or maybe sometimes even better. So, in my opinion, I do not think that cervical myelopathy is a reason not to do a motion preservation type surgery. But again, it has to be, you have to tailor it to the patient's situation and their exact needs. But um, no, I, I do not have a problem with disc replacement in that setting. Um, assuming that the, like a one and two level cervical disc replacement and an ACDF have roughly similar recoveries, what would that look like for a typical patient? Like how long is the surgery? How long do they stay in the hospital? How long do they have to be off work? When do they start PT and things like that? Sure, um, so the, the recovery and, and, um, and post-op care for either a fusion or a disc replacement are very similar. The surgeries themselves don't take very long. You know, you're looking at one to two hours, depending on how many levels, how complex it is. Um, a lot of places we're doing these as outpatients now. Um, it used to be traditional where you keep them overnight and observe them, but even now one or two level anterior procedures can be done as an outpatient procedure where you go home the same day. Um, personally, I do not put them in any type of neck brace or collar. Uh, I let them um, be up and walking right away as soon as they get home. In fact, I encourage mobilization because moving is better for your recovery. Yeah. Um, I uh, usually just limit them to no aggressive high impact exercising or lifting more than 15 pounds for the first four to six weeks, just to let everything calm down. 
once they kind of hit that six week mark, I lift all restrictions. And for me, physical therapy post-op for either one of those uh, procedures is dependent on how they feel they can get back to normal activity. If they feel like they're young and healthy and they can progress on their own, we may never end up doing therapy. If they feel like, gosh, I'm very stiff and sore and I feel a little bit deconditioned, then that's where therapy plays a role. Dr. Michael, um, when we treat these patients, um, the majority of patients actually do well with non-operative treatment. Is that fair to say? Not, not everyone needs surgery. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about how that happens. You evaluate a patient. Right. So and you start treatment. Absolutely. Uh, the, the vast majority of patients that come in with cervical stenosis and cervical conditions don't end up in surgery. Um, and that's because a lot of these things can be treated conservatively. Um, and those kind of treatment options include physical therapy, uh, some kind of anti-inflammatory treatment, whether it be non-steroid or steroid and anti-inflammatory treatment. Um, it could uh, end up with epidural steroid injections. And to be honest with you, primarily time. A lot of these things that patients come in with severe acute pain, uh, with time, those things do tend to resolve on their own. So um, I oftentimes will tell patients as they come in, you know, seeking a surgical consult, you know, if we can just drag this out with some conservative treatments in time, most of these patients don't need an operation. The body has an unbelievably, remarkably powerful capacity to accommodate and heal. I'm, I'm always absolutely. amazed about that. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Things are looking very good for the world of spine. We have tons of treatment options. We're getting more and more you know, historical information on how everything is working. And I think we happen to be at a time in spine where we're reaping the benefits of all the hard work that our predecessors put in. So thank you very much. You. Um, if, as a patient, you wanted them to just have a few things that they take away from this discussion as a summary, what would they be, the key things? I would say that um, just reading stenosis on an MRI report is no cause for concern. Um, and that- uh, That's good. Yes, you know, uh, it really does depend on what the patient's symptoms are and correlating with what you see. Um, the second thing is th we did talk about surgical options today, but the vast majority of these spinal conditions uh, involving cervical stenosis do not require surgery. It's yep. actually the minority of those patients. So that's take home number two. Uh, and the third thing is, um, you have, to, you have to tailor these procedures to the patients. And um, you know, a patient coming in saying, I want this and I want that, and I heard this guy had this, doesn't mean it's not an option, but it may not be best for your situation. So you have to trust your surgeon that they'll give you, they'll offer you what they think is the best for your unique scenario. I can remember all those. Those are really important points. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs>